Support Wrestle Talk. Follow us on Twitter. The definition of the word shocking is causing indignation or disgust, offensive, or causing a feeling of surprise and dismay. Another way is the more British informal use of the word, as if to say WWE has had a shockingly bad 2018. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the first two definitions, the most shocking moments from world wrestling entertainment in 2018. The moments that left us flawed, dismayed, disgusted, offended, or just generally surprised. Let's not dawdle, let's dive into it. These are the 10 most shocking WWE 2018 moments. Number 10, another failed Money in the Bank cash-in. The Money in the Bank contract is as close as you can get in WWE to a guarantee. In almost every case, the briefcase holder goes on to become WWE champion within a few months, with only a handful of exceptions. When Braun Strowman got his massive pause on the briefcase at this year's pay-per-view and became monster in the bank, a future run as Universal Champion seemed inevitable. After all, it seemed a dead cert that Braun would wear the strap anyway, and now we had a big gold briefcase that basically said, you've got something that belongs to me. Braun said he was not going to do it like everyone else by sneaking up on his opponents when they're weak and rather do it to their face. He tried this at SummerSlam, telling Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns that he would face the winner of their match immediately after it was finished and, well, it didn't quite work out for him. So instead, he cashed in the briefcase to Baron Corbin to get himself a Hell in a Cell match at the pay-per-view of the same name against Universal Champion Roman Reigns. Mick Foley was even the special guest referee. But when Brock Lesnar came down and beat both men up, the match was declared a no contest and the briefcase was never mentioned again. Braun Strowman has now become the fourth person to attempt a Money in the Bank cash-in unsuccessfully, joining such in-ring titans as John Cena, Baron Corbin and... Ah, uh, Damien Sandow. Hmm. Number 9. Ronda Rousey's WWE Debut Just prior to the Royal Rumble, rumours began to heavily circulate that former UFC star and Hollywood movie badass Ronda Rousey had signed with WWE and might be the surprise number 30 entry in the inaugural Women's Royal Rumble match, with some sites even claiming she could win the whole bloody thing. But when Trish Stratus entered the match last and there was no sign of Ronda, few fans in the building were visibly disappointed. Then, following Asuka's win, and stare down with Raw and SmackDown women's champions Alexa Bliss and Charlotte Flair, the familiar sound of Jonah Jett's bad reputation hit the PA and Rousey marched to the ring. The place went nuts. Ronda then spent an awkward yet hilarious amount of time pointing at the WrestleMania sign, making her future intentions crystal clear in WWE's trademark not at all subtle way. Immediately after the show, it was confirmed that Ronda Rousey had signed a full-time deal with WWE and she would be with them going forwards. It was a huge coup for WWE and one of the reasons why they were able to pull off such a favourable deal when negotiating their television contract with Fox. Rousey's name carries a lot of weight and gave the promotion a a lot of credibility. It also helps that she's taken to pro wrestling like Otis Dozovich to a stake. Her first match at WrestleMania was an instant WrestleMania moment that will live long in the memory of wrestling fans. The crowd in New Orleans were electric for her exchanges with Triple H and Stephanie McMahon and came unglued when she won following an awesome performance. Number 8. Asuka's streak ending at WrestleMania Look, this wasn't the case that Asuka's streak ended. I mean, it had to end at some point. It was the wet fart of an ending that gets it on this list. And really, the point of an undefeated streak is not just how you end it, it's how you follow up on it. Asuka's streak was a long-term project, the likes of which aren't really seen in WWE in the modern era. She had never lost a match in NXT, spending the majority of that time as the brand's women's champion and delivering great match after great match in every major appearance. She continued her winning ways on the main roster, but somehow WWE found it harder and harder to book her and keep fans interested. Fairly soon, she had destroyed the majority of the roster on Raw and was forced to start selling for long periods of time times in matches against lesser talents like Nia Jax in a desperate attempt to have fans buy into the reality that she could lose, which they didn't. With that said, nobody expected Asuka to walk out of her WrestleMania title match against Charlotte Flair with anything but a victory. I mean, one of my big predictions for WWE in 2018 was that the main event of SummerSlam would be the undefeated Asuka defending her title against the equally undefeated Ronda Rousey. To me, that just seems to make the most sense. But uh, no. Asuka lost the match cleanly in a damp finish, thus ending her streak. She then lost a couple of weeks later when she moved to SmackDown, and then lost to Carmella of all people on multiple occasions. She even lost to Iconics when she became a tag team with Naomi, and everyone's beaten Iconics. 
Basically, WWE dropped the ball with Asuka's streak, and it took her a long time to recover. Number 7, John Cena's hair. I mean, just look at it. John Cena's appearance at Super Showdown in Australia was his first for the promotion since his underwhelming victory over Triple H at Greatest Royal Rumble in April, and fans were shocked at what they saw. Gone was the buzz cut John Cena we'd known for the past 100 years he was on top, and in his place was this weird combination of John Cena and JBL. Okay, in reality, all Cena had done was allow his hair to grow out for a movie role, but it looked ridiculous. Like, so ridiculous that it was the main talking point coming out of a show that saw the Cruiserweight title change hands in a show-stealing match and had a main event collision between The Undertaker and Triple H. All everyone wanted to talk about was John Cena's bloody silly hair. Cena, good humoured as ever, acknowledged the JBL comparisons on Twitter and thanked him for the hair grooming tips. Number 6, Nicholas. One of the most anticipated moments of WrestleMania was the promised reveal of Braun Strowman's mystery tag team partner in his tag title match against The Bar. Rumours swirled about the identity of the mystery man. Could it be someone returning from injury like Samoa Joe? Maybe Braun would reunite with former Wyatt family head Bray Wyatt, who had not been seen since Matt Hardy hurled him into the Lake of Reincarnation during their ultimate deletion match. Or perhaps it could be a debut. Several names were also on the verge of making their WWE returns at the time, including including Bobby Lashley and Rey Mysterio. But it was none of those. Instead, Strowman plucked a 10-year-old kid from the crowd, who in reality was the son of referee John Cone, and had him stand on the apron while he casually demolished the Flummox Tag Team Champions. Braun and Nicholas won the belts, with the latter shattering every youngest title holder record in WWE. The belts were vacated on Raw the next day because Nicholas couldn't get out of school. This all really happened. Honestly, Nicholas might go down as the most surreal moment in the history of WrestleMania. A literal child won the tag team titles. Number 5, Shawn Michaels wrestling return. Wrestlers not staying retired has become such a cliche that no one even bats an eye anymore when someone makes a miraculous return to the ring after years away. It's almost expected at this point that wrestlers will return from their retirement for one last glorious run and a big fat payoff. Shawn Michaels was always thought to be the exception to that rule, however. He stepped away of his own accord to become a family man, going out in style with one of the all-time great WWE matches in the main event of WrestleMania against his great rival The Undertaker. It could not have been a more perfect ending to his career. Sean resisted the urge to return on multiple occasions, politely declining when WWE asked him to step into the ring and square off against the likes of Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles. Sean stepping back into the ring and various dream matches were always discussed and debated, but we all figured it would never happen. That all changed in 2018 when HBK changed his mind thanks in part to a massive Saudi Arabian paycheck. Michaels agreed to come back teaming with DX buddy Triple H against old rival The Undertaker and his storyline brother Kane. It was the ultimate dream match 20 years ago. In 2018, however, it all felt a bit lame. The sight of the 53-year-old stepping into the ring for the first time in eight years with a shiny chrome dome replacing his legendary locks was a jarring sight. It was also a sad one. Michaels held up his end of the bargain and put in a performance that was impressive considering the limitations of his half-speed opponents. But it was all a depressing sight. At no point did it feel exciting that one of the all-time greats was back in a wrestling ring. Unless Shawn Michaels wrestles again, and he claims he won't, but then again we have heard that before, this will be the final memory of his legendary career, and what a shame that would be. Number 4, Brock Lesnar doesn't leave. The argument can be made that Brock Lesnar is the smartest man in wrestling. Reportedly over the last six years since returning to WWE, Lesnar has threatened to quit the promotion and return to UFC, only to re-sign for fewer dates and more money. And Vince McMahon falls into this trap every time. Lesnar goes to UFC and sits in the crowd, has public meetings with Dana White and starts hyping fights that are never going to happen, and Vince responds by writing him a fat check. Honestly, it's masterful manipulation. This year it was supposed to be different though. Lesnar was definitely leaving after WrestleMania, you know, once he put over Roman Reigns in the main event. We all knew that was happening, right? I mean, that was the story they'd been telling for a whole year. We'd sacrifice Samoa Joe and Braun Strowman so he could coronate Roman at WrestleMania. Only that's not what happens. Brock won the match and signed on for one more outing for major Saudi money at Greatest Royal Rumble. And then he beat Roman there as well. Finally, Brock dropped the title at SummerSlam and re-entered the USADA testing pool. That was it. 
confirmation that he was heading back to the world of MMA. Then he came back at Hell in a Cell and recaptured the Universal Championship at Crown Jewel. And now he's going to be at Royal Rumble and WrestleMania again. I think we can all agree that no matter what is said or what Brock says, he is going to stay with WWE as long as they keep paying him those big bucks. Number three, Dean Ambrose's heel turn. Kind of like Asuka's streak ending, Dean Ambrose turning heel wasn't a prediction, it was a spoiler. Since he came back from injury, all buff and full of beard and shaved hair, we all knew it was only a matter of time before he turned his back on Seth Rollins, just as Rollins had done to him years prior. It was the plan for WrestleMania 34 before he got injured after all. It was bound to happen, but it didn't happen when we all thought it would. It didn't happen at SummerSlam, it didn't happen at Hell in a Cell, and it never happened on the Raws in between. When was this guy? By turning heel, they've been teasing this for weeks now. And then, on that night of all nights, Dean Ambrose finally stabbed Rollins in the back and nailed him with the Dirty Deeds after winning the Tag Team Championships in dedication to their fallen brother. In a year where just under a thousand wrestlers turned heel, this one stood out from the pack. The genuine gasp and heat from the crowd was incredible and jaw-dropping. Not everyone was on board with WWE's timing of the turn, but for me it was a genius move. And not just that, was a shocking genius move. Number two, Crown Jewel still went ahead. WWE's first foray into Saudi Arabia in April for Greatest Royal Rumble was controversial enough due to the kingdom banning females from working the show, be it in front of the cameras or behind the scenes. I mean, even Stephanie McMahon was banned from attending and she makes all the history. And then the show itself was little more than a propaganda-filled advert for the Saudi Arabian Tourism Board, filled with videos about how awesome and progressive the country is, while ignoring all the parts where they are the total opposite of that. Six months later, the promotion returned to the country again for Crown Jewel, a show which played host to the in-ring return of Shawn Michaels, the WWE return of Hulk Hogan, and featured a World Cup tournament to determine the best in the world that existed purely to mock political rivals Qatar hosting the 2022 FIFA World Cup. The fact that WWE were running an event where women were banned from wrestling less than a week after promoting the all-women show Evolution was not lost on anyone. Never mind all the talk of revolutionizing women's wrestling, the proximity to Crown Jewel made it clear that WWE were merely trying to make up for doing something they knew was morally wrong. Evolution was done purely to silence the critics against Greatest Royal Rumble. However, it was not the fact that women weren't allowed to wrestle all the propaganda videos that hung over Crown Jewel, and rather the very real-life murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, an outspoken critic of the Saudi regime. If you somehow lived under a rock during this time and missed all of this, essentially Khashoggi was murdered inside the Saudi consulate in Turkey for his views, an assassination that was reportedly ordered by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. The slaughter became international headline news and WWE felt pressures from the media and high-ranking politicians to terminate their relationship with the Saudi regime and pull out of Crown Jewel. Rumours were abound in the weeks leading up to the event that Crown Jewel would be cancelled, or at the very least moved to the UK, where WWE was set to start their European tour just days later. But the show did not get cancelled, and WWE still went ahead with it, deciding that money was greater than morals, even though John Cena and Daniel Bryan disagreed when they pulled out of the show. But this time, rather than air promotional propaganda videos, WWE rarely mentioned the country they were in during any of its promotion. They did the show, and they moved on. And it won't be the last time they do it either. And at number one, Roman Reigns' leukemia announcement. When Roman Reigns walked to the ring on the October 22nd edition of Monday Night Raw, nobody watching was prepared for the bombshell he was about to drop. Speaking out of character, Reigns told the world that his real name was Joe, and he was a leukemia survivor, having fought off the disease 11 years ago. But now, it was back. The revelation felt like a hammer blow to the gut of wrestling fans around the world. Reigns vacated the Universal title and embraced his teary-eyed Shield colleagues one last time before leaving to begin the long and difficult treatment process. To see a man at his athletic, physical and career peak have it so cruelly ripped away from him in such a manner was absolutely heart-wrenching. It rendered all of the previous snarling and gnashing of teeth opposing his push completely irrelevant, silly and meaningless. This was undoubtedly the most shocking moment in WWE in 2018, and it might be the most shocking announcement in the history of the company. A speedy recovery, Joe. We wish you all the best, big dog. Which wrestlers should quit WWE in 2019? Elf Bakerdor Laurie Blake has another list for you, which you can check out by clicking that little video on screen right now. Go on, give it a little click. I've been Luke Owen, and that was wrestling.